Hello, everyone. My name is Deborah Rue, and I'm with Rue Global Impact and also the co-founder of Billion Strong. Today, I'm going to introduce you to Mary Fernandez with Cisco. I met Mary at a conference a few months ago, and she blew me away. I was like, wow, this is our future. So she, um, I recommended that she come to Zero Project as a speaker, and she accepted, and she's here with her, her beautiful mother. And so Mary Fernandez, welcome to Zero Project. Thank you so much, Deborah. Um, I, my name is Mary Fernandez, obviously, she, her pronouns. I am a brown woman with uh, curly hair that's longer than shoulder length. I'm wearing a black dress today with a beautiful lime colored jacket, um, right on par with the conference colors and black pumps. And I will follow her lead and say I am slightly older than, I'm a mature woman with gray and purple hair, and I'm also wearing green today to celebrate Zero Project. So Mary, tell us about your journey, um, especially we'd love to uh, hear more about how you grew up in Colombia, which is a beautiful country, but it's still considered a developing country, and you moved to the United States, and now you're working for Cisco, wow. So. Do you mind telling us a little bit about your personal journey to get here? Absolutely. So um, I was born in Colombia, and um, when I was little, my mom decided to immigrate to the United States, as many immigrants do, because there would be greater opportunity. And at the age of four, three or four, I was diagnosed with glaucoma, so we knew that I would be going blind, and that was just a greater impetus for her to stay because she knew that um, the U.S. would offer more opportunities for me. So I grew up in New Jersey, proud Jersey girl through and through. Um, I went to undergrad in Atlanta at Emory University where I majored in psychology and music. And I always say that my performing arts education was the best part of my education. Um, I have worked in the disability fields for, um, I worked in it for about six years, legal, doing pre-employment transition services, um, and I really have a passion for it, and I want it to be taken more seriously, so I decided to go get my master's in business administration from Duke University. Um, I landed at Cisco through my internship in business school and uh, decided to go back because I love the culture. Cisco is a company that really cares about its people. And at this point, I am the lead disability inclusion consultant, really helping us shape how we think about disability inclusion accessibility and build it into our business strategies in alignment with all of our business priorities, knowing that this is an interlock rather than a competing interest. So I guess y'all understand why she impressed me. Uh, so I am curious, how, how how was it growing up in a developing country and then moving to the United States that's, air quotes, considered developed, even though I think we're all developing, but do you, did you find the way people were being treated in Colombia was different from the way people, are being, people with disabilities are being treated in the United States? Yeah, so I think when I think about disabilities and people with disabilities, uh, we are considered and, and we are a marginalized community. And the more intersections you have around identities, the more that can show up in different ways. And so one model that I find really helpful to think around oppression in general and marginalization is called the four eyes of oppression. So ideology, when it comes to disability, there's this idea that there's one right way to have a mind and body, and that's obviously not true. We think about institutional, which are all of the systemic policies and legal ways in which people are marginalized. We think about interpersonal, which is how people behave towards each other. Um, and within disability, there's so many examples like the infantilization of people with disabilities, the systemic disenfranchisement and justification of that. And then the, the um, internalized, which is how the ultimate goal of oppression, and it really is meant to make marginalized folks feel small and take um, less space in the world. And so when I think about it from that perspective, the reason I, I think that's important is because when you think about cultures and when you think about globalization of equity work, what we know is that equity and inclusion are local issues. But when we have a global perspective, when we have this big framework, we understand that the solutions must be driven locally 
and that oppression is experienced differently depending where you are. So in the United States, for instance, in graduate school, I faced uh, accessibility barriers where I did not have any accessible materials for my statistics and economics class at all at Duke University. Wow. Whereas in Colombia, as a little girl, I didn't go to school at all, right? So there are different experiences of oppression, but when we think about it from that same model, they fit. Wow, that is a powerful answer, Mary. Uh, that's very, very impressive. So obviously you are an advocate, but you also represent a global brand. The, I know that we've talked a lot about uh, compliance and how our beautiful United States is um, very driven by compliance and litigation. And what do you have to say to corporate brands? Is that the way to go? Should we really be worried about doing it so we don't get sued? Or, Mary, your turn. <laughs> <laughs> so this is what I would say. Um, when we think about equity work, and I'm using the word equity very intentionally, because equality is giving people the same things and expecting it to work. So Deborah could hand me a print paper right now, I'm blind, I'd be like, okay, Deborah, you gave me the same thing you have, but that don't work for me. <laughs> Whereas equity, Deborah would give me braille, which is what works for me, and I give her print, which is what works for her, right? So th those are differences. So when we think about equity and justice work, what we know is that equity often leads to legislation and but legislation rarely and sometimes even impedes the work of equity and justice. And so when we think about legislation, when we think about laws and compliance, if that's your focus, then you're, you're at the floor. It's literally the bare minimum because inclusion is driven, driven by equity. That's why we do diversity, equity, inclusion work, accessibility work, belonging work, right? All of these things are interlocked. And so, no, compliance absolutely is not the answer. I know everybody watching this knows this. But let's think about it from that greater, you know, when we think about brands, our brands from a marketing perspective is a promise. And so at Cisco, we are promising uh, empowering an inclusive future for all. Well, you don't power inclusion through sheer compliance. You power inclusion through social justice and equity, which is something that we have beautifully done at Cisco um, by publishing our social justice um, actions and beliefs, which really focus on how we move equity, not compliance, forward. You, you blow me away, Mary. You just blow me away. You're so smart. And, and I'm just so glad <laughs> you are at you. the leadership <laughs> table. I'm just so glad. It gives me such hope for the future. Um, what, what, would you, what, what kind of advice do you have with, for corporate brands, global brands like Cisco, to more meaningfully include us? Once you, you gave us a great answer about the compliance, but what would you recommend to other corporate brands and even Cisco to do this maybe a little bit, you know, more seamlessly and more yeah. inclusively. I mean, what, what do you recommend to, what advice do you have to corporate brands? Yeah, I mean, I want to start by acknowledging that any equity work, any work that um, seeks to de deconstruct oppression is messy. It's inherently messy. And it also uh, involves a level of discomfort because in order to dismantle something, you first have to name it and you have to break it down and then you have to learn new behaviors, right? And so there's that whole piece around being able to have this honest conversations, courageous conversations around what systemic barriers and institutional barriers we have put up as the business community internationally to systemically exclude um, people of different identities. So I think that's the very first piece. I also, um, at Cisco, we do this beautiful thing called sponsorship. So sponsorship is not allyship. Um, sponsorship is people in power who have access. People like Deborah coming up to Mary Fernandez, a brown woman who's very young, and saying, hey, I want to give you the microphone. I want you to speak. That's her sharing her access to power and influence with me. And so as corporations and as you know, individual leaders, if you're in a leadership position, find people who are different than you. Get to know them, get proximate. That's something we do really well at Cisco. And then provide them access to those circles of influence where you live. Because if we don't put people who are different than us in decision-making positions, we're never gonna shift the narrative and the way that we operate. 
and just know that it's going to get crunchy, it's going to get messy, and that's okay. It's part of the learning process, but guess what? At the end of the day in business, we really care about competitive advantage. We care about market share. And you can go on Google right now and look up the statistics where people with greater accessibility businesses prioritizing accessibility, disability inclusion, inclusion across the board perform 28 to 30% better with market share than businesses not doing it. So if the moral argument isn't doing it for you, let's look at the numbers and let's tackle it. <laughs> I agree. And also, um, the way the young leaders are stepping up uh, I'm, I'm an elder, and I've <laughs> never seen um, the young people step up to lead like I'm seeing now. It is it give it just really really warms my heart and gives me a lot of hope for all of us. Um, and so I know you are a youth leader. We were talking the other day that uh, it's funny. I'm sure you don't feel like a youth leader, but the UN it's 35 years and younger. So I'm definitely not a youth leader, <laughs> but. What advice do you have for young people all over the world, younger people that want to join, they want to make a difference, they want to truly have impact? What advice? Because, I mean, you're, you're what, how old are you, Mary? I'm 33. 33. That's also an indiscreet question, Deborah. but okay. I know, I know, <laughs> especially to ask another woman. Wow. <laughs> But I do it to make a point that you are in a global role as Cisco at 33. So what advice do you have for your peers around the world that want to be seen and they want to contribute and they want to be part of these conversations because they feel they can add value? Yeah, well, one, you are, you can add value. You do add value. I think when we have um, interse intersecting identities that are um, typically marginalized because of those four eyes that I spoke to earlier, that internalized piece, it can feel like we are devalued. And, and in fact, we are. There are systems that are literally created to exclude us. However, know that your identities, your intersections are in a lot of ways your superpower. When we think about the people that are successful within the psychological literature, what we see most often is resilience. And resilience is built essentially through hardship and surviving. And so embrace that as your superpower. Um, one of the things that has really helped me is understanding my why, understanding my own philosophy. Why do I wake up every day? Why do I do this work? And for me, my why is creating space for people with disabilities to share their voices, experience, and create change. So providing my access and my influence to pass on the mic. My, I walk with a white cane, and so I imagine myself as just sweeping that cane in front of me and making, like, y'all make way. Uh, <laughs> so I think understanding the why, finding community, community and mentorship, a big part of my development pro, um, progress and journey was being part of the National Federation of the Blind in the U.S., which is a deeply powerful advocacy organization. And so finding my people, having those mentors. And mentors are people who advise you, who can grow with you, and who can help you understand, like, hey, these are, these are some things that you might want to get curious about. And I think the last piece is getting curious, right? Because if we don't get curious about the world, then we stop growing. I think what's most important is approaching all of this work, any work that you do with humility, um, I always say that the day that I start thinking I'm the smartest person in the room, all of a sudden I'm not as smart anymore because you got to learn every day. Every day I learn something new. And so that commitment to growth, curiosity, knowing your why, finding community, I think are really important. And I will add, those, that isn't it. I don't have the full answer, but I think those are parts of the puzzle. As I say, wow, have y'all met Mary Fernandez? <laughs> Cisco, you are so lucky to have Mary Fernandez. And you don't have a chief accessibility officer. I've got a good candidate. Oh, sorry, <laughs> promoting Mary. But Mary, thank you. Thank you for coming to the Zero Project. I know you brought your beautiful mother with I you. Did. What a <laughs> gift. And we, I really look forward to watching your career advance. But you are blowing me away with what you've already accomplished. So let me give you the last words, and then we'll say adios. <laughs> yeah, just want to thank Zero Projects for inviting me and for the commitment that I've seen throughout this conference in uh, promoting youth and youth leadership. It's 
it's phenomenal and I'm just really encouraged and it gives me hope every day to not only be in community but also see that shift the the shift that we're seeing in the entire world so thank you so Mary's around Mary Fernandez and she's working find with me Cisco. on LinkedIn <laughs> find her on LinkedIn thank you Mary thank you